And uh, so let's see here. Yeah, we have participants are coming in slowly one by one. Um, mm -hmm. Let's 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 wait a little bit until until people have a live on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, mm. A disclaimer: This is my first time I'm hosting something, so bear with me with my nervousness and the. Uh, uh, yeah. But but it's fantastic to do uh, to be able to do that together. I remember yeah. the first time I had to moderate something; it was a disaster. Yes, so I hope it's not a disaster. <laughs> it won't be like you. Yeah, yeah. Nicola, Hello. You yeah. Uh, much hey. more skills there, Nicola. Great to Hi, see Nicola. you. Okay, so why don't we put? Um, uh, okay, let me first introduce before we get started. Um, today, uh, Yota Teodoni will be moderating, and I will be her her co-moderator, and. Uh, uh, and we will introduce our speakers after the reflections. But let us first start by showing you the slide that encourages you to do your reflections. Right. And you, of course, might remember why this, the reflections are so important to us. Um, it's Neuromatch Academy is improving every day. So we're taking oh, your so reflections <laughs> every day and, uh, and, and are trying to improve the summer school. Uh, Jutta, the present button is in the upper right here. All the way in the upper right. I, I share screen. I just now cannot think of how I do the in Google. Anyway. Uh, uh, right, right left to the share button, all the way in the upper right. Ah. To the left. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I haven't thought, <laughs> I haven't thought to, to practice that. <laughs> But, but the students can already start. Now, like for interactive students, yeah. there's the uh, reflections for the observer ones, there's the reflections. Yeah, and uh, yes, please. Uh, uh, I always like to say it's very exciting to get your feedback. And uh, we really highly uh, appreciate the negative feedback. So things that can improve. Uh, uh, praises we can do later. Uh, but if you have anything constructive, this is what we are aiming for mainly. So yeah, please do it. And uh, as uh, my friend Junjie says, uh, it's a community and uh, everyone, the community needs everyone's voice. So we need your feedback. And once you're finished with this, feel free to also start filling in your questions. We're like, uh, we like after a short introduction to make sure that we get to as many of the questions as we possibly can. Shall we wait like uh, how much? Like five minutes, so, three minutes? Yeah. We're, we're waiting about five minutes here. Um, and there are uh, two links for interactive and uh, observers, uh, uh, students. Um, I hope we have uh, both interactive and students and observers today. I like how this part of every day's show is like super awkward because we are all on stage. They have to do their reflections <laughs> and, and, and we're here smiling. That's the best <laughs> we can do. Okay, so here we have an interesting suggestion. Oh yeah, first for, for Everyone, they love the uh, the content today, oh. and um, and they suggest that we should have a reflection dance. Um, I can't provide a reflection dance, but I can wear a hat. Does it like make up for a reflection dance? Here, yeah, make how's that? What is a reflection dance? I don't know. They didn't specify that. Okay, then it works. The hat. <laughs> okay, shall we stop sharing and uh, and uh, move uh, move on? Um, what is I'd it? Give, I'd give them another minute. Okay, like... I'm uh, too impatient. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I just want to see the questions, and I cannot while I'm presenting. I think that's why. Ah, okay. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Uh... But, but we, we need to do the introductions for our speakers. We will ask all of them to 
briefly summarize their scientific side and give us a sentence about life. So, okay, I think I think we can start now. I mean, like okay. everyone had the chance to like click through that. Uh, thanks so much, Yota, for going through that. Um, so, so do you want to moderate the introductions? Uh, yeah, please. Uh, should, should I introduce myself, mm -hmm. or uh, the, our panelists can? So start why don't you briefly introduce yourself as well, just so that people have an example of an introduction? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Yota. Uh, I'm a, a postdoc at uh, NYU, uh, at the Center for Neuroscience, and uh, I also work uh, with dynamic systems mainly and. Uh, uh, for my PhD, but also now again to study conscious perception, uh, like the the model you you saw in your tutorials, but uh, adding one more excitatory pool and uh, add more, like two more differential equations of adaptation, so you can have uh, some. But anyway, I don't want to go into details. Uh, I'm from Greece. I'm from Athens. I'm, uh, I'm a physicist uh, by training and. Um, I enjoy and I think uh, philosophy is important. Uh, so my interest is going there as well uh, lately, more and more. And uh, when I, what I want to say is that when I want to escape the rigid barriers of uh, science and scientific thinking, I escape to art. I use art to do that, uh, to express thoughts that, <laughs> that is not confined within uh, limits. Cool. Yeah. So. Uh yeah. Yeah, and please, uh, uh, let's start with our panelists and maybe start uh, with uh, Ken Miller, if you would like to introduce yourself and then you can pass the, um, okay. ask someone else of the our panelists to introduce themselves. Okay, so I'm Ken Miller. I'm uh, at Columbia University uh, in the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience. Um, and I've worked on, um, I'm a theorist and I've worked on modeling the development of neural circuits and their mature function uh, and primarily visual cortex, sometimes higher visual cortex, occasionally other pieces of cortex, occasionally thalamus, but that, that's been my focus. Um, and uh, when I'm not doing science, well, I play folk and blues guitar. I obsess <laughs> a lot about politics and I, I care passionately about some kind of justice in the world, but um, unfortunately don't have a lot of time to do much about it other than obsess. And, um, and I have uh, twin 14 year old girls and, and my wife and they, I spend a lot of time with them. So that's my life. Thank you. Thank you for sharing something uh, more personal. Uh, uh, who would you like to go next? Oh, uh, Tatiana, why don't you go next? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Tatiana Engel. I'm also a computational neuroscientist. I'm now assistant professor in Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, uh, which is on Long Island in New York. Um, it doesn't look like New York City at all. It's all beautiful out in nature, just on the beach. Very enjoyable place to spend the self-isolation period. Um, my background is in physics. I was uh, studying stochastic processes uh, for my PhD, and then I moved on in computational neuroscience. And I worked on modeling, uh, developing uh, neural circuit models, which can explain decision making and category learning. And I'm also very interested in data analysis and identifying interesting dynamics uh, in neural data, which can be linked to behavior of the animal. So fun fact about me, which is also has some relevance to neuroscience, I guess, during the pandemic, um, I decided to uh, start playing violin again, which I didn't touch in 15 years. So I didn't oh. touch it a single time in 15 years. And I was amazed by how much the brain remembers. I thought I will not, I will, I thought I will have to start from scratch, mm -hmm. but it comes back so quickly. And this is one thing which I really enjoy right now. Nice. And it's very complicated violin. I, I wish I could play it. I think it's the most complicated. I, mean, I had played many years when I was young, but then I stopped for 15 years, which is a, uh, a long period of time, but I was how, just how is this memory retrieved? How, how could exactly, you retrieve yeah, that memory? I think I said, yeah, what can the what nervous system it? tell us about it? Yeah. So, so, so why don't we hear from Nicola next? So I'm Nicola Brunel, and um, so I'm um, 
professor at Duke University in the departments of neurobiology and, uh, and physics. And uh, so I'm also a physicist by, by training. And I'm, and I'm from uh, France originally. Um, so I've worked, so I'm also a theorist and I've worked on, uh, on different issues in computational neuroscience from single neural models, uh, network models, and lately mostly um, issues related to uh, learning and memory. And um, so what do I do when I don't do science? Well, I have three kids, so that takes a lot of time. So, <laughs> so uh, I don't have much time to do anything, anything else. So. Great. What about you, Avant? Well, um, I'm also a theorist. I studied electrical engineering. Originally, I'm from India, now based in Stockholm. Um, scientifically, I'm very much interested in uh, network activity dynamics, starting with the work of Nicola Brunel, Ken Miller, and all that. Uh, I've been working a lot about how activity goes from one brain region to another. Lately, I've been interested in brain diseases, and in particular, how we can use these dynamical systems concepts to create a framework for what I would like to call as diseases of brain dynamics, and hopefully maybe even control it. Uh, what do I do when I don't do science? Um, well, I, I, I'm a cricket player. So, so nowadays I don't play, I watch a lot. And um, just to give you an idea how difficult it is, a typical match that the kind of cricket I like, it goes on for five days. So there goes my week. Great. This is a, thanks for the great introductions. I think we should jump right into the questions. Um, so, so I think um, I'm excited, in fact, that Alan Sang's question has been voted highest, which, which was very high on my, I'd like, like to ask a similar question list, who asks, uh, what do unstable focuses slash fixed points mean physiologically? And I think we can zoom out a little from that question, kind of. I think the, the question is, how we can build bridges between like this way of, uh, of modeling dynamic neuroscience and the experimental data. Who, who, who wants to uh, get us started on this, uh, on this thought? I, I can start. Great. Yeah, I would like to start maybe with this um, broader question which uh, you, Conrad, asked. Um, like how is it useful to do this dynamical system analysis to understand how a biological system work. And I guess um, a good example of it is, um, there are many good examples on the level of single neurons, on the level of bigger circuits, but I would pick an example of decision-making and um, multiple simple models of decision-making were proposed, which consists just of a few populations. And of course they're way oversimplified, but the advantage is that we can do this precise mathematical analysis to determine the structure of stable fixed points and to interpret activity of a neural circuit using this structure. For example, we can say that the decision corresponds of, by, of moving activity from one attractor to another attractor. And we can also see how, for example, when network is driven by the stimulus, this dynamical portrait of a system changes. So we can understand why when the stimulus is shown, the activity leaves one attractor state and goes to another attractor state. And why is, this, why is this level of understanding is important? It is because we can make very precise predictions about how the circuit will respond to perturbations. For example, if we have a model like this, and if we can link or reduce a full biophysical model to this level of description, we can make predictions on the level of, for example, if I change excitation inhibition balance in the circuit, how will my tendency to do quick or accurate decision change, right? So something about behavior of an animal can be captured and linked to all the level down to things like excitation inhibition balance in the circuit, which can be manipulated in experiment. And the way to link those two is exactly this level of mathematical description where we understand the uh, dynamical objects like attractors, unstable fixed points, stable fixed points. I guess I would add um, particularly unstable points. Um, 
I mean, the, the first answer is they don't have physiological meaning because those are places that the system doesn't go to. Um, <laughs> the, the second answer is it could be the case that you get very slow dynamics near those unstable fixed points and those slow dynamics might play some kind of role. Um, I've never worked with that, so I can't really say very much about that, but uh, Amri Barak and David Cicillo have published uh, a paper about that, the idea of these very slow points that aren't exactly fixed points. I don't know to what extent they're talking about unstable fixed points or just things that are slow otherwise. Um, so, so are these, go ahead, are these sorry. slow points actually seen in biology? No, like, like I, I think that uh, to, to just bring back the original question, like can we observe in an experiment that we, we must be in one of these like, like unstable points where the system rests for a long time? Well, again, I think the usual, the, the point of an unstable fixed point is you move away from it, not towards it. So you're unlikely to be able to observe it. Uh, but, you know, if you happen to, you could, you could speed away from it, but if you happen to move away from it slowly, then maybe you could see some kind of slow dynamics there. And I would just refer to the Barack and Cicillo paper. Um, I, I think more generally, the, you know, populations of, you know, millions of spiking neurons with dendrites we reduced to, you know, thousands of rate of point neurons that have rates, and um, is obviously a lot lost. But it's amazing how much you can learn and understand about the behavior of neural circuits that lets you then go back and make testable predictions that, in fact, allow the, the experimentalists to get insight into their system in a way that they couldn't have without the framework of your model. So, more generally, that's where the dynamical systems comes in. It's a particular level of studying uh, circuit behavior that really can give a lot of, of insight that works all the way up to the real system. One place where you, you meet a, a saddle node is a single neuron spiking, where neuron sits very close to the threshold and uh, a very small perturbation then lead you to spikes. So at a single neuron level, you can easily observe it even in experiments. For a large dynamical system with so many neurons, I think it's very difficult to observe it because there are so many unstable directions that, yeah, most likely it never stays at particular fixed point. Someone else wants to add something? Shall we move on? Okay. Uh, so the other most voted uh, question so far uh, comes from Jake Gavenas, and the. Uh, I don't know, he or she, I'm sorry, I'm not sure, uh, asks uh, uh, how about you have uh, more uh, populations, AI populations, uh, either uh, uh, many E and one I or many EI, how would that be, how, how would this uh, be uh, translated in fixed points, but also in network behavior and dynamics and uh, relate also to functions, uh, I would add. So who would like to jump in? I'll, I'll just say that I, that's a very active uh, area of research for, certainly for me, I think for Nicola, uh, I don't know if Tatiana perhaps, but it's a very active area of research right now to just incorporate the three uh, most common inhibitory subtypes, the paralbumin, somatostatin, and VIP, and the circuit between them, as well as the cytatory cells. I don't think there's a, a simple answer to your problem. That's a research question, exactly how we're going to make sense of this. Um, I can give you one example of how we make sense of it, which is uh, in what I talked about, the inhibition stabilized network. I told you that the really robust principle was not that the inhibitory cells change their rates paradoxically, meaning when you stimulate them, their steady state rates go down, but that the inhibition received by the excitatory cells changes paradoxically. When, if you stimulate inhibitory cells in a way that makes the excitatory cell lower its firing rate, it also paradoxically lowers the inhibition it receives. And that's a generalization of the original idea of the paradoxical response of the inhibitory cell firing rate that came precisely by thinking about, well, what if you have multiple inhibitory subpopulations? Then it's no longer the case that you can predict that one of them has to go down or one of them has to go up, but the net inhibition received by the excitation has to go down if the stimulus to inhibition drives the excitatory firing rates down. So that's one example, but I think it's a very open question. If things get much more complicated very quickly and, and you try to find structures. I don't know how to say more than that. 
And I guess it can be, uh, that would be one option, but it can be different architectures, like uh, two excitatory pools and one inhibitory, or three excitatory, one inhibitory, or one excitatory, many inhibitory, and uh, that would lead to different um, uh, scenarios and dynamics. I don't know who wants to, Nicola? Yeah, I, I, oh, I guess, sorry, yeah. I guess another example where people held, have dealt with this multi-dimensional dynamical system problems extensively is actually dynamics of single neurons because people study models which have multiple kinds of uh, membrane currents. And then they also end up to understand dynamics of this very biophysically detailed model they also have to deal with this multi-dimensional problem to understand the bifurcation structure in a high dimensional space. And the tools which are sometimes used in this setting is for example, separation of the slow and fast variables in the system so that you can treat slow variables as constant and then you study bifurcation space of fast variables. So maybe some of those tools can be then borrowed and used to understand dynamics of these multiple neural types. So, but, but let me follow up a little on that question. So as we make our models more complex, now we go from two dimensions where we can meaningfully understand it. That's a lot of it we've done today. Uh, towards three, towards five, towards more dimensions. So which of the concepts that we can meaningfully argue about, like stable attractors or something, how, how, how well do they carry over into these high dimensional spaces? Um, I think very well. I mean, the only, you know, when you have three dimensions, you have the possibility of chaos, but uh, other than that, the, 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 kind, the types of attractions you can have don't really, don't vary with the dimension. Um, so the understanding the bifurcations, the kind of attractions you can have, uh, is going to apply in any dimension. The, the other thing I wanted to say is that there's sort of two ways to expand the dimensionality. One is to have many neurons of a single type. And the other is to have multiple subtypes, which you might first study as one unit per subtype, like, a, like one E and one I unit, but with more subtypes. Um, going to many neurons of a given subtype, um, <clears throat> there's various methods that you can use to do that, um, starting from the low dimensional system. Uh, if you assume that there's some mean connectivity between subtypes and then random variation around it, you can use uh, certain methods in random matrix theory to try to characterize then how that population will behave uh, starting from the mean behavior of the single of the single type. Um, you can also, if you simplify the connectivity, like in our paper on balanced amplification in 2009, we, we made up a simplified connectivity where both excitatory projections were identical and both inhibitory projections were identical. And then we could mathematically analyze it. You can, you can, you can compute all the eigenfunctions and, and see exactly what's going on. Uh, and by studying that simple case, you then maybe get some insight uh, that you hope will carry over as you simulate more complicated cases. Great. Uh, so so there's, 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 there's another question that I'd briefly like to come, uh, come to, which is a question by Samuel Orion. And uh, it's somewhat related to what we discussed, but I, I still, I, I'd still like to hear a little more from you about it. Uh, Samuel writes, in yesterday's outro, we saw some beautiful work on showing that you could understand computation occurring at the level of the dendrite. Um, how might that level of granularity play into today's ideas? Now, like at some level, if, 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 if I was malicious about the dendrite field, I would say it's unbelievably complicated. Everything is so high dimensional and it's like a distributed process and all that. And if I look at like today's, maliciously look at today's slide, uh, topics, it's like, well, we can like model everything as like, a, like groups of neurons that interact with one another. Like, so, so hearing your thoughts about like the interactions between these two ways of thinking would be very interesting to me. There, there have been a few attempts at uh, trying to understand the impact of dendritic nonlinearities on network dynamics. I can think about couple of examples, the work of uh, Raoul Martin Memesheimer, for, for instance. And um, so, in, of course, in this work, the idea is not to uh, use incredibly complicated 
uh, neurons with uh, thousands of compartments, but rather to try to simplify as much as possible these dendritic nonlinearities to, to study their impact on, on, on network data. In, in this case, I think if I can, if I remember correctly, he was interested in uh, propagation, uh, propagation of information in, in synaptically connected neurons and how these dendritic nonlinearities might affect that, and also generate high frequency oscillations. So I think that uh, you can definitely incorporate this, uh, 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 these, uh, these things in network models, but I think as usual, it's always very useful to start by a highly simplified setting where you, you, you really uh, uh, try to use the simplest possible model that incorporates, for example, in this case, linearities. Um, but yeah, that's, but, but that's for sure, that's something that's been very, uh, I would say. I, I would like to add to it maybe just a little bit to say is that I guess it's not really well studied, like not many people. I know work of Bartlett Mel who focus on uh, how dendritic computation can contribute to network dynamics, but like, I don't think there is a lot of work in this area, but it can be important because we like to simplify. But on the other hand, we go and study simplified circuits uh, and arguing about like what mechanism can underlie one or another function of this circuit. But maybe we are missing something fundamental because like we try to figure out how neurons which are point neurons realize the computation. Well, maybe exactly the dendritic nonlinearity is what's happening in biology. So I think it's something which is not like very strong, or maybe I'm just ignorant of the field. At least it's not like something I, I'm very familiar with, but I would like to see more work in this area. Yeah, Bartlett Mel uh, suggested that, um, that you could think of the dendrites as point neurons that just happen to be in a circuit where they all converge on another point neuron, which is the soma. Um, and so in that sense, you could, you could model it as a, a circuit of point neurons. Um, on the other hand, um, Matei Yangel had a paper recently arguing that um, several things conspire to make the integration in the dendrites linear, so to make the soma see the inputs as though the dendrites weren't there. I like that answer because it makes my life easy, uh, but I don't know if it's right. Uh, <laughs> although Matei Yangel is extremely good, um, but uh, yeah, I think there's so much complexity in the circuit. We each kind of choose our level of simplification and then study what phenomena we can understand at that level of simplification. We're certainly not gonna get everything. Um, and the dendrites obviously gonna play an important role, but we're trying to see how far we can go while we, we ignore them and how much we can understand while we ignore them. If I may add, uh, I think it also depends on the kind of questions you're asking. So. A couple of years ago, uh, there was a paper out from uh, Blue Brain Project where they had uh, individual neurons in all their biological glory, as much we could uh, uh, measure. And it turns out that at least at the network level, uh, if you look at global activity dynamics, correlation structure, this network doesn't differ by much from a point neuron network with uh, uh, equivalent connectivity. So I think uh, uh, Ken is right in posing this question that how many of these experimentally observed nonlinearities actually sustain when you put it into a large scale system. And I think I'm also on this side that most likely when we have a large number of inputs, some of these nonlinearities will be smoothened out exactly the way the, the leak integrate fire neurons nonlinearity is smoothened out when you have noise in the, in the net network. So something similar might happen there. Um, so I think it depends on the question and how do you uh, um, capture it. So some aspects of dendritic nonlinearities could be taken care of, like Matthew Larkum talks about uh, that dendrites make neurons uh, uh, spike in bursts. So yes, you can think of bursts in neurons. So you can modify the neuron model to burst. Or you can take into account the fact that neurons uh, synapses are far away. You can have weight distributions. So some things you can capture. I want to just mention one thing. My PhD thesis was about modeling the spiking and bursting of den in dendrites using Matthew Lacombe's data. So, so I have a lot of love for that kind of a model. 
Well, you were a neighbor of uh, Kevin Martin, so you know neurons very well. <laughs> and and I, one other thing to say about the general question is that part of the art of modeling is um, is controlling the complexity of the model so that you can actually gain understanding. Um, so if you try to throw in all the ingredients, um, you you can't understand it generally any better than you can understand the brain. Um, and furthermore, so many of the parameters, when you try to throw in all the ingredients, you have to make up because we don't know all the parameters. And so you're almost certain not to be in the right parameter regime anyhow. So, but there's an art to it. What you, what question do you want to study, and then what's the what's the simplest way you can attack that question? So people who study dendrites, like like uh, the other Yota, another Yota, Yota Quadrazzi, I don't know. With I, yeah, um, and who who was a student with Bartlett Bell, and now very much doing her own work. Uh, but she and Bartlett and uh, are focused on dendritic integration, and a little bit of venture into what that means for circuits. But they really are looking at how the the cells integrate. We're thinking about circuits, and so we want to ignore that to think about how the interactions between cells lead them to integrate, lead them to behave. Uh, eventually, we have to put it all together, but if you put in too much at once, you have a hard time understanding anything. Nice. Uh, I think I have, uh, I have found a question that can fit uh, here. I hope uh, it makes sense to you too. Uh, from uh, Maria Kudari. Uh, Kodari, uh, who is asking, um, uh, can you use this uh, framework basically also to uh, model uh, fMRI data or predict the voxels, uh, uh, the voxel activity in a region of uh, interest? Uh, um, uh, in, in the sense that uh, uh, you use this, you can, you said you can use the same model, the rate mod, the the simplified model to model dendrite and then the soma, but uh, you can also model uh, an ensemble, uh, one neuron or many neurons, or uh, at a macroscopic level. Uh, so what do we understand from that if we, if we use the same framework at different scales? Um, can we do it? Does it make sense? Or uh, Actually, Yota, the person you're working with, XJ Wang, has been doing a lot of that. Maybe you might. Yeah, have I, 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 I'm serving the students. I'm not uh, here. <laughs> My role here is to bring this the question of the students. Uh, exactly the same question in the European time zone as well. Oh. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Like, like yeah. to which level is it a good idea to apply this model using regions of interest in MRI data? What do you guys think? Uh, can you clarify what this model exactly refers to? Like a Wilson Cowan style model. Mm -hmm. I will lose Nicola. And, 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 and arguably, Carl Freston is kind of doing some stuff in that general direction. Like, you can just to sketch the idea. The, the, the underlying idea, not like of, uh, of the uh, wilson Cowan model, is they have two populations that do stuff to one another. Similarly, if I have fMRI data, I can say I have two recorded like populations of neurons that do something to one another. In both cases, I presume I can fit like a network to it of interacting neuron types. Yeah, certainly XJ Wang has has been doing that, has been building models of areas as point neurons, areas that, you know, point areas interacting. And, uh, and Gustavo I, Deco, who, who is actually yeah. uh, using, uh, actually studying human brain uh, by having this AI uh, network that you saw in the tutorial and uh, taking this AI many, many times, uh, uh, having this as the unit of uh, one area and connecting from excitatory to excitatory to basically uh, simulate uh, fMRI data. Um, and I see in the chat that somebody also mentions John Murray at Yale. Um, yeah. And then there, there's a chat before that, I don't know if it's about this topic or previous one, talks about Elena Jones, who is a TA for NeuroMatch. Um, also, Victor Girsa, and he has, I think, gone to the farthest in this because they are using their virtual brain uh, uh, framework. To I couldn't hear, who, who did you say? Victor Girsa. Ah, Girsa, yes. Yeah. I mean, a colleague of uh, uh, Gustavo Deco, and uh, yeah. uh, 
they are now using it to build networks which are patient specific and trying to predict the outcome of the surgical interventions in epilepsy. Uh, there is apparently even a human trial going on about this. So, so it seems like in some sense, it is a useful uh, uh, thing to do, it looks like. I, I think the proof is in the pudding. I mean, you simplify the question enormously. You have areas interacting with each other. The question is, do you learn something that you didn't know before that gives you some new insight that you can then go out and test? If so, then it's a good model. So, so, but let me understand how success and failure look like in that domain. Now, like I can take my model and I can fit it to data. What is, what you, you said the proof is in the pudding, but like, how, how do we evaluate the test of the pudding? Now, like we fit this model, how would we know that like this model should guide maybe clinical interventions? Now, Arvind, you mentioned that they, they moved to clinical trials. So what does it mean for us to want to use such a model for clinical trials? I don't know about a clinical trial, but the question you asked before that, what's what success? Um, what, I, what I really believe is success is when you understand a mechanism that's going to give you a certain kind of behavior regardless of the details, uh, like you know, the, so I, the innovation stabilized network that I talked about, um, you know, the, if the excitatory cells are unstable by themselves, the inhibition they receive is going to behave paradoxically, irrespective of many, many details. But what, um, what, does it, what does it mean for inhibition to be paradoxically? I'm, 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 I don't sorry, it, so it, it just means that if the, if you stimulate inhibitory cells, then whatever way that makes the excitatory cells go, the inhibition goes the same way. If the excitatory cells firing rates go down, paradoxically, they're getting less inhibition. Or if it goes up, paradoxically, they're getting more inhibition. Um, and that will survive. I mean, it may not survive every, every complexity you can throw at it, but it'll survive an awful lot. Um, and so that, to me, is, is the goal, is what I really want. Now, whether I can achieve that, I don't know. Right now, we're wrestling with these four input types. And that's the kind of insight I want to get. We're not there yet. Um, and another kind of insight is just, I've got a model that fits the data and I try to make it do something and it does something and I do an experiment and test whether the brain does it too. And that's a certain kind of success. It's not as satisfying as really understanding why it does it. So you know it's robust to a lot of details. That's not, you know, it's not some peculiarity that's happening in the brain for a different reason than in your model. Yeah, I mean, I mean like uh, just to to maybe plug tomorrow's day. So for me, I want something extra of the models. I, I don't just want that they fit the data, but I also want that they reflect causal reality. So so what I mean with causal reality is if I would take a component of the model and I would perturb it, and I'm sure Tatiana knows much more than 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 I'll ever know about that. But basically. Um, if we can take the model, take the components and perturb it, then the model should also be able to predict what happens in those perturbation situations, which kind of goes beyond just the model describes the data that we recorded. And for that, that's, that's of course tomorrow's day. Yeah, well, that, that's part of what I meant by saying, you know, if you can then predict if I do X, I'll see Y, and the experiment really does it. So perturbations are, a, you know, perfect example of, of, of what that would be. Yeah, but isn't it uh, interesting though, if you use the same model uh, in different scales, you actually have the same hypothesis and uh, everywhere. So how, how, if you have the same hypothesis, there's uh, non-linearity and dynamics at the macroscopic scale and also at the microscopic, you already assume that uh, everything is connected. Uh, it is connected somehow to preserve this because uh, we are used to a uh, model very to, to be very uh, narrow uh, looking and, and our models we look at this specific problem at this specific uh, using this specific model but we as far as uh, my understanding we, we are we we are not used to take a step back and see how our different models relate to each other um how how my finding relates to that finding at a different scale and if it is, they use the same model, how, how how these two might be connected? What do you think about that? 
So if I may say something here, so one thing I think we can observe in the brain at different scales is that uh, you will find excitation and inhibition are interacting. Whether you look at an individual membrane, there are currents going in and out. If you look at microcircuits, there are synapses which are positive or negative. If you scale it up, go to mesoscale, then there are areas which are inhibiting or exciting. So it's not a surprise then that we find the same mathematical structure that fit it because it's eventually some EI interaction. Uh, since this question came up in the previous discussion and I took a different stand there, I said that <laughs> actually it is uh, somehow limits of our abilities to define a better descriptor at different levels that we fall into this trap that uh, they are basically mathematically equivalent. So I, I'm, I'm actually divided as I thought more about this. I do see there are similarities that travel scale and that calls for same mathematical structure. But it's I also recorded, think, you know, it is, uh, it is recorded and stays yeah. in YouTube. <laughs> Each level, I think, brings its own rules of the game, right? And this is something that we need to discover. But, but let, me, let me follow up a little bit in that direction. So we have a model that we we feel we understand meaningfully at the microscopic scale, no? where we can, like, with the, follow, with the things from yesterday, talk about, like, integration in dendrites and spiking and maybe nonlinear dendrites or maybe not or something like that. And we have a system that we feel comfortable at the small level is like that. But if I have a system of a million interacting neurons, it may very well act very, very different than a simple model where you have an excitatory pool and an inhibitory pool and that just simple, in a very simple way, influence one another. No? So, so where do you see like the limitations of the applicability of those models? Limit, limitations of what? I missed the end of what you said. Uh, well, the, the, the end was just like, uh, how far do you think kind of like this approximation, which effectively ignores the identity of which neuron spikes, how far can we push this? And, and Yota, sorry, you, you were- you I were just talking. wanted to chip in the, the question from Juji and Jiang, which is related to this, uh, because uh, I just wanted to um, add it uh, because it's, he asks uh, uh, if you ha if you couple two or more AI local circuits of the Wilson Kwan model, can we generate chaotic behavior? And if it can, how can we understand it biologically? Uh, and if we can't, uh, what the, what does this mean then? So I think it relates to to what you asked. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, again, someone one, wants to say something about that? Yeah, if anybody else has something to say, please jump in. I can I can say something. Yeah, please. Um, as I said before, one way to go from the you know one unit per cell type to many many neurons of each cell type is is to consider random connectivity around some mean connectivity, and use random matrix theory to understand the behavior. Um, can, can you briefly say something about random matrix theory? I'm, I'm sure a lot of people will miss that. Okay, so ra high dimensional matrices of uh, random, randomly drawn numbers have, have very regular properties. Uh, the most famous is the, the eigenvalue spectrum. If you, if you select uh, every uh, entry from a, a a Gaussian distribution, then you get a circle of eigenvalues whose width is determined by the variance of your Gaussians of your elements. Um, but you can compute more than that, and you can compute uh, correlations and variances, and um, you can compute a number of things. Um, so that is, it's, it's, it's difficult stuff. I, mean, I have my postdoc, Agostina Palmigiano, is, is working on that right now. Should, to look for a paper from her in the next year or so going through this. But um, other than that, I, I think really, again, that so long as we're getting insight that the experimentalists go back and test and it seems to hold up, then we can say we can keep doing it. When we can't, then we say, uh-oh, we, we need to put in some more complexity. So maybe this is the right point to transition to JR's question. And, and I don't, I, I want you to not overly focus on like the super technical details, but rather like 
give us a flavor of the big picture how one would do it. The question by JR is how could you we uh, how could Wilson Cowan model parameters be fit to experimental data? And that more generally stands for like how can models from the class that we are looking at, how can you fit that model to real world data? There was some, it's maybe a technical answer, but there was some recent work which I find very interesting from two groups, one from Jakob Macke and another is from John Cunningham, which exactly asks this question. So usually when we have a theoretical model, we study its behavior, which means we change parameters of the model and we study how the model behavior changes with these parameters. But fitting means something else, right? We have a set of data and we want to find model parameters which best describes this data. And usually these biophysical models will never really fit to the data. We just studied their parameter spaces. So they come up um, with um, a scheme with an algorithm which is based on Monte Carlo sample techniques. It's called uh, approximate Bayesian computations. So that you can basically generate synthetic data from the model and you can define a metric which you think what should be the quality of a good match between model and data and then you can generate many many samples from from different parameters of the model in intelligent way to describe like which parameter regime is actually best describes the data so i think like it's an interesting technique which can be explored in this setting there's also another approach which is um Agustina Palmagiano and Mario De Papa from my lab and Natalia Kranyukova, Kranyukova who works in uh, with Tatiana Chumachenko in Germany have all been using, which is um, if you assume the, the input output model of the SSN where the output is a power, is the input raised to a power, then you can take, so if, let's say the power is two, then you can take the square root of both sides and you get the square root of the rate is equal to this linear equation in the for the input and so if you then measure the rates of the, the mean rates of the different neuron subtypes uh, in our case we're considering neurons in different positions or different subtypes then those mean rates are the data and now you have a linear equation for all the weights that are going to produce that data and so you can just use linear regression uh well non-negative least squares uh to get the uh the weights from that and then mario's been taking it further by using uh, backprop through time to then refine the solutions that he gets. They, 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 they look for many, many solutions, search for the best ones, then refine them further. So that's, I, I'm sure people are going to invent many ways to do that. I happen to know this one because people in my lab are working on it. So I should just mention backpropagation through time is the standard way with which the deep learning guys that you will listen to in like just two days uh, train systems that actually have dynamics. So, so in that sense, it's a very popular technique at the moment. I can, I can mention yet another way of uh, fitting uh, wilson current models to data. So I've been, I've been collaborating with an experimentalist uh, at NIH, Mark Heistead, who's recording the responses of excitatory and inhibitory neurons um, to optic stimulation. But it turns out that this data by itself is not enough to constrain the connectivity parameters. So the idea we had then is we can pharmacologically block specific types of connections. We can block excitatory connections. So basically we are setting the W um, A E, well where the presynaptic neurons is, is, is excitatory to zero. And then that gives us another data set. And we can then after block the inhibitory connections pharmacologically. And then we, we had another relationship between the rates and the optogenetic inputs. And, and all together, then it turns out that we can kind of reasonably um, get the parameters of the connectivity matrix with a reasonable accuracy. So that's something that, that came out this year in uh, eLife. Um, uh, I think uh, it would fit now here the question from Sam uh, Tabaxi, uh, who is asking. Uh, we learn a lot about models, uh, and uh, it's hard to decide which model fit best fit our uh, hypothesis. So, what is what do we do? Do we uh, how, how do we know which is the right model? And uh, do we need uh, more uh, research in animals and experiments, so, as you said, like more uh, evidence, uh, or we need uh, more sophisticated uh, theoretical models that can. Uh, 
uh, differentiate between uh, alternatives? Uh, what, what's the best strategy to, to select, to, to know which model is? Uh, maybe Nicolai, you wanna go? I think I missed a crucial part of the, I, I have a bad connection for some reason, right? So I need, I need oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I just told you because uh, I thought it, it adds to what you were saying before, but it's fine. Uh, Nicola, uh, if you open up, if you click on Q&A at the bottom, you can find the, the question. It's from, all uh, right. the first but, name is CEM and the last name looks like the back to. And, but it's a great question. I like the question is in a way, do we need to do more work on the modeling side? Or do we need to be more uh, to be doing more work on the experimental side? And I think I can guess what you'll say about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the answer is both. <laughs> it's always both. How, how do you pick? I mean, there are different ways to uh, choose uh, which is the right model. I, 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 I'm more satisfied when uh, if you have uh, different models to see, uh, to have uh, different qualitative predictions and then uh, choose among that. But there are other approaches that people use with statistical methods. And, uh, and uh, is it a matter uh, to what level each one is satisfied or is it more ground truth <laughs> that we can all uh, agree uh, uh, upon? I guess there are several levels to answer this question, right? Like you can ask what is the right model? Models can be on different level of abstraction in the first place, and models on different levels of abstraction are useful. They can make very different predictions. For example, a model on the level of populations of neurons cannot say like in detail what happens if you have some genetic disease which changes dendrites or particular ionic current in your network, right? So it will not be able to address any predictions on very detailed biophysical level but in, it will be um, able to address prediction on, on a more coarse level. And as has been mentioned in this discussion previously, maybe some of these predictions on a coarse level do actually do not depend on exact particular details on more macroscopic levels. So I think that uh, experimental test is an ultimate test for any model, but I also think that there is place for models at different level of abstractions. And we can go between different levels of ab abstractions depending on the question which we would like to ask. And different models um, can have advantages. For example, more abstract models, they're kind of more interpretable. We can understand them better. We can also more easily feed them to the data. And we can select among different hypotheses which are expressed on the same level of abstraction by different models, right? So we can say is it attractor dynamics, or maybe it's just some flow. Is, oh. Yeah, or is it just some non-stationary flow uh, between unstable fixed points, right? So it's a um, very abstract level of modeling. It doesn't have to do with biophysics, but still it can make predictions which, which are testable. So I think um, we have to think like about these distinctions what is the detail of the model we are, which we are talking about. And on the same level of detail, clearly there are models which are correct and which, we are, which are wrong. But when we go between level of abstraction, it doesn't mean that more abstract model is definitely wrong just because it does not contain all the biophysical detail. Right, I, I think I was, uh, I was thinking at least, I don't know if uh, Sam uh, was thinking the same, uh, within the same level, if, you, if within the same level, you have uh, different uh, alternatives and different approaches, how do you choose among these? So then uh, theoreticians should make hard to make very clear predictions to design perturbation experiments so the different models will predict different outcomes. And then experimentalists need to do work to actually perform those experiments. I think that's the best scenario which can happen. I also think it's it's not anything you can prescribe. It's um, in the end, it comes down to do you get insight out of the model or don't you? Um, and you can't know that until you try. But usually, you see some phenomena from experiment that intrigues you that you think there must be some structure under it that you have some idea how you might go after it, and you see if you can get insight into how that phenomena happens. And if you do, then it influences experiments. And, and ultimately, you have a dialogue. And when you have a dialogue between experiment and theory, when, when uh, experimentalists, when theorists are actually giving insight to experimentalists into what their data means and what experiment to do next, then, then you know things are working. But I don't think there's a formula. I, it's really an art of 
finding the right level and the right question where you can get insight. If I may say, uh, I think pragmatically speaking, choose a model that you have and you understand it. And then you apply it to the data. If it breaks, excellent news, because now you have understood the limits of your model. If it doesn't, you have a nice paper at your hands. Uh, Nicola, you would like to add something or? Um, no, I think I, I mean, there have been already very good answers to the questions. So I don't think I have anything to add. OK. Um, I, it's, it's really sad because there are many questions from the students, but I think we need to uh, wrap up. Uh, and But before, uh, and um, we're sorry that we cannot address all of them, please uh, bring them to the Neurostars and uh, where you can discuss it with your fellow students and uh, the TAs. Um, and, uh, but uh, we would like to uh, finish with uh, some insights and thoughts uh, from uh, each one of you. It is a great opportunity to have you here and the uh, pleasure. So we want to hear your thoughts uh, based on uh, about uh, dynamic network networks, but modeling computational neuroscience in general, and whatever you, you feel you want to share with the students. Exactly. Everyone gets to give us like one minute of like the, the most meaningful message that you can <laughs> give, uh, give to the students for, for the future in, in this area of science. Should, 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 should we start with Arvind? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I received an advice when I was a grad student and I still use that. It was very practical. Uh, Peter Latham told me that never simulate until you know what the result will be. Because it's a temptation that you want to put in yet another biological detail in your model. Uh, what I understood was that when you put something in your model, as a theoretician, I think it becomes an obligation that you have to explain what this new parameter is doing to the phenomenon that you're explaining. Our job here is to give a mechanistic explanation. So I think we have to provide this, this information. So I think unnecessarily loading your model with biological detail without assigning function to them is actually gonna make your life more difficult. And, and these models, you know, they, they are maybe very simplistic uh, rate models that we studied today, but I think they give very good starting point, good insights are there. So use those. Oh, why don't we continue with Nicola? Well, I would say I mostly agree with Arvin. Though I think there is also value in exploratory uh, simulations. And uh, so I think you shouldn't be confined always to the same model all your life. Uh, though I think it's a balance. I mean, it's, and it clearly depends on the question. It's, it's, it's pretty much an art. I think already Ken has mentioned this, that there is no prescribed formula, unfortunately. So. Um, yeah. and, and, and Nicola is certainly one of the big artists of the, <laughs> of the discipline, if I can say it like oh, that. Oh, yeah, you're, you're breaking my, my view. I use art to escape science, not <laughs> for science. <laughs> but so, I understand. So, so, so what about Ken next? Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I think I've already said, but I'll just recap. I mean, it is. The, 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 the most important way to evaluate a model is do you get insight? Uh, and of course, what does insight mean? We could talk about that for a long time, but do you learn something that you didn't know before? Um, and something that's robust that, you know, is, is, isn't going to depend on exactly this detail being exactly this way, but it's something deeper. Um, and hopefully something you can then devise experimental tests out of. Um, sometimes I describe modeling as <clears throat> you're building a, um, can't even think of the word for it, you know, when you, the, the framework for building a building that you then, the scaffold. Um, you're, it, the, a model is, is like a scaffolding um, that once you build the building, that is once you gain the insight into the mechanism, you don't necessarily need the model anymore. You can now incorporate the mechanism into your, into your intuitive thinking but you would have never had the intuition without the scaffolding of the model. Um, so 
yeah, it, it's to gain insight. And in order to gain insight, there's an, an art of how much you simplify, how much you throw away, how much you keep. And, and there's no formula other, you know, you just have to try and have some instincts for the problem. The, the more you know about the biology, the more you know, and the more you're talking to experimentalists, the more you have a sense of what are kind of the critical variables and, and what might not be. Um, I can't say much more than that. Yeah, thanks. So what are we hearing from Tatiana last then? Yeah, so I hear what Arvind said, but I also think there is a big and important role for exploration and model is sometimes the same organism we can study, just let's say a real brain in a dish. And one example of this is how people discovered chaos theory, right? So they were simulating a model and then computer stopped and they restarted the simulation and they realized, wait, answer is getting completely different, right? So this type of discoveries also happen when you just try to simulate and explore the models. And this leads to discovery of new theories. So I think it's also an important component. And for neuroscience today, I think where we should be heading, so what is a successful theoretical framework, in my opinion, we are getting so much data nowadays. And this data comes both about activity of neural circuits, about connectivity of those neural circuits, and we also get very uh, powerful perturbation tools, which we can use in experiments. So I think our models should combine all these three together. So they should not only model activity, but we should make use of the connectivity data. And we should try hard to make very specific predictions for perturbation experiments, which can be tested. OK. That's nice. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for sharing this. It's uh, I feel very sad that it passed really, really fast this hour. I wish we could stay more, but uh, I, 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 I hope the students enjoyed and uh, and got some insights from uh, from all of you, uh, all of us. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, I hope I see you at uh, some other venue at some point. And um, thank you for coming here. And uh, and it was just fantastic being able to kind of show like, in a way, these four theoreticians here are an important part of the bedrock of the fields. It was just fantastic having them all with us. So thanks so much for all of you for making time to talk with all of us. Thank you so That's much it. for the opportunity. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank Good you. evening, everyone. Bye. Thank you.